Okay, it actually looks like we've got a good amount of people already on the call. So we're going to go ahead and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, aloha, everybody. Mahalo for joining tonight's webinar. My name is Sarah Sukidono, and I'm the Communications and Development Manager for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, and I'll be the MC for tonight. This month, we're joined by Madeline Sherman and Hanale Ho'opai Silva from Restore with Resilience, a community-focused initiative to restore coral reefs in Hawaii. Tonight, Madeline and Hanalei will present on thermal tolerance and community engagement in coral restoration across Hawaii. Uh, as a quick side note, if you enjoyed tonight's talk, you can sign up for our monthly e-newsletter, Reef in Brief, to receive updates on future talks and future events from MNMRC. You can sign up for that on our website at MauiReefs.org, or we'll have the link available in the chat throughout this talk and at the end of the evening. So. Just wanted to encourage you guys to sign up for that. And tonight's presentation is uh, part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean speaker series, usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui, so mahalo to them for making tonight's talk possible. And for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, sorry, I got my slides mixed up there. <laughs> for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're celebrating 15 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish. MNMRC began with community members coming together to address coastal and marine resource management concerns and has grown into the organization that we are today. Um, our work to protect Maui Nui's precious ecosystems takes many forms. And since the wildfires, we've been working with partner agencies and organizations to ensure our precious natural resources are protected from further damage. Some of our recent projects include water quality monitoring. Uh, we're part of the Hui Okavaiola, which is a community-based water quality monitoring group that currently tests at over 30 locations around Maui, including seven within Lahaina Town. And the data that we collect from these sample sites is critical to understanding current water conditions for our future, for future comparison. We also have done coastal profiles, collecting, con con collecting continuous data profiles of water conditions in Lahaina and North Kihei, capturing information for tur turbidity, salinity, acidity, and oxygen, oxygen content. This will help us understand changes over time in response to fire and stormwater runoff. We've also done reef mapping. In September, we hosted a team from Australian tech startup Flying Fish Technologies, who mapped Maui's leeward resource, uh, Maui's leeward reefs post fire using the Vertigo 3 glider, which is a underwater survey tool that is capable of covering 25 acres an hour while also capturing 50,000 high resolution images. And this large scale documentation uh, took about six days and provided a pre-impact baseline that can be referenced in the future to determine when, if, and where any downstream effects are having a negative impact on our coral reefs. There was a whole presentation on that, and you can find that on our YouTube channel, which is, if you just search Maui Reefs, you should be able to find us. And we're also first, first flush responders. We're ready to deploy some of our staff to capture runoff from the first flush or initial discharge from burned watersheds when the first big rains do arrive. When this happens, we'll coordinate with our partners to collect water and sediment samples from the first flush. Uh, we're also working to launch Hawaii's first ever reef-friendly landscaping certification course in spring of 2024. Many of you know that what happens on land affects the health of our near shore waters, which is why it's important to minimize harmful runoff to our coral reefs by adopting reef-friendly landscaping practices. The certification course will be a 10 subject curriculum taught by local industry experts. And if you're interested in learning more about that or participating, please get in contact with us at info at MauiReefs.org to be notified when enrollment opens. 
And of course, if you like this talk, if you hear about all of the good things that we're doing and you would like to support us, we are coming up on Giving Tuesday um, and we would love to receive your support and your end donations. You can go to mauireefs.org slash Giving Tuesday um, if you would like to see us to be able to continue to do all these wonderful things. Um, Giving Tuesday is not till November 28th, but of course we welcome any early donations and we just wanna say mahalo in advance for all of the support that you have been giving to us throughout the year. And you can also make a donation to Hui Okavaiola uh, to recover its West Water West Maui Water Lab that was destroyed in the fire. Um, this is something that we use to analyze the water samples and do all kinds of things. And it was destroyed, unfortunately. And so at this time, we're hoping to find a container, uh, a container possibly or trailer type of office to be the new home for our lab and to replace any of the equ equipment that was lost. So we will also drop a link into the chat if you'd like to give specifically to that. Um, and if anybody has any leads on a place to house this lab and have water and electricity hookups, which will also be needed once we get it, please again, reach out to us at info at mauireefs.org. Okay, and just a few notes before we introduce our speakers. Uh, we're going to leave time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. And so we invite you to submit any questions throughout um, the presentation using the little Q&A button at the bottom uh, lower edge of your screen. And this presentation is being recorded and streamed to Facebook. So it'll be available there and also on our YouTube channel um, for viewing and sharing once the night is over. And if you're joining us on Facebook tonight, you can submit questions as well. Just please drop a comment and those questions will be relayed to me um, and we'll get to it during the Q&A portion of tonight. So. Without further ado, these are our speakers, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them. Madeline Sherman is the project manager for the Coral Resilience Lab in, at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. While managing the outreach and education for the Coral Resilience Lab, she has directed various youth and community programs, including a molecular biology mentorship program for underrepresented students in STEM, developed interactive curricula on the importance of corals in Hawaii, and coordinated community coral restoration projects. Madeline has also served as a marine science teacher, a laboratory technician at Hawaii Pacific University, and an assistant aquarist at the Waikiki Aquarium. Being raised in Mauna Ula Bay, Oahu, the ocean is her playground, and when not under the water working, you can find Madeline at the surface, either surfing, snorkeling, or swimming. Tonight, we also have Hanale Ho'opai Silva, and he was born and raised on the island of Maui. And as a fisherman, spear diver, and surfer, from a very young age, he understood how important the marine ecosystem was to everyday life in Hawaii. He's currently working with Coral Resilience Lab and is helping to lead their Restore with Resilience project on Maui. Hanalei does much of the data collection and analysis for Restore with Resilience Honolulu and Kaneohe using structure for motion photogrammetry. Um, wow, that's a big word. Well, so now that you know a little bit about our presenters, Madeline and Hanalei, mahalo for being with us tonight. And the talk is all yours. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So, um, yeah, so thank you all for being here. Um, we hope everyone's doing well, and we know it's been a difficult time for a lot of you. So thank you so much for spending time with us um, to hear our talk today. So um, as Sarah said, we are um, with the Coral Resilience Lab on Oahu in Kaneohe Bay. And today we'll be talking about one of our projects, Restore with Resilience. Um, so coral reefs, they provide a multitude of benefits, uh, not only for marine life, but for humans as well. And one of those being coastal protections. So coral reefs buffer about 97% of the wave energy um, and they aid in reducing wave height by about 84%. And with all these benefits come some problems. So um, corals are unfortunately uh, facing widespread bleaching. And um, we definitely see this here in Hawaii. So here you can see this was taken by a confocal microscope. And uh, the picture on the right 
it is a uh, Pasolifera coral, and you can see the density in the symbiote. So the red are the individual symbiotic algae cells that live inside of the coral. And then the picture in the middle is the same species that has partially bleached. And you can see the difference in the density between those two photos um, of the symbiotic algae. And then the photo on the right is a completely bleached coral, um, a close-up of a polyp. So the bright green tissue that is the coral host tissue, and then the little red dots that you can kind of see on the right side of that polyp, that's what's left of the al um, algal symbionts. So um, corals, when they get stressed out being exposed to elevated temperatures, um, they will release their symbionts, and that is what we see when a coral bleaches. Um, the, the tissues are transparent, and it's actually the algae that gives the coral its color. Um, so in our lab, um, back in 2014 and 2015, there was a back-to-back -back bleaching event, and uh, there was a large percentage of corals that bleached during this. Um, there wasn't enough time in between to recover, and so um, some researchers in our lab went out and actually tagged these corals. So you can see in this photo, um, they're the same species. They're a Montefer capitata. Um, they're in the same conditions. They are on the same reef. They're right next to each other, experiencing the same conditions. However, one has bleached and one has not bleached. Um, so these are corals that have naturally bleached, and uh, we call this a living library, and we use this uh, for to gather information. And so here in Hawaii, what we are doing is proactive reef restoration. So fortunately, in Hawaii, it hasn't gotten as bad as some places around the world. Um, so we are intervening with already existing corals in that area, um, and this is to increase return on investment, and um, we hope to enhance what's already there by finding corals that have a natural resilience to heat stress um, and using that to further seed the reef and enhance um, the overall resilience and recovery. So then in comes our Restore Resilience project. Um, so this is a collaborative project between um, NGO partners, um, institutions, as well as um, government agencies. And so the whole goal of this project is we want to um, outplant resilient corals um, to enhance the overall resilience of that reef. And um, we are doing this by a couple of different methods that I will talk about. Um, and we have a couple of established, established sites um, in Hawaii already. So here, um, the, we have three sites on Oahu. Um, our site over by the airport, or we call it South Shore. Um, we have 425 completed outplants over there. Um, in Kaneohe Bay, there are about 3,000 outplants that we've completed this year. And then in Mauna Lua Bay, we've uh, taken 250 biopsies of corals, and we actually plan to stress test those um, in the next couple of weeks before the end of this year. Um, and then Hanalei will talk about Maui and the specific sites that we have over there. Um, and then in Kealakekua Bay, um, we've established a living library. So again, those side-by-side -side bleached and non-bleached corals um, back in 2019. Okay, so the process of our Restore with Resilience project. So we are targeting corals of opportunity. So we don't want to touch any intact reefs. Um, so these corals of opportunity, they are about basketball size or bigger corals that have fallen off of the reefs. And, you know, they could fall off the slope. Um, they might be tumbling around in some sediment. And so uh, they're not attached to the larger reef. And so they have a lower likelihood of actually surviving. And so we're targeting these, these corals um, because we, A, we don't want to touch any intact reefs. And um, B, we're giving them essentially a second chance of life. Um, and we're not transporting any corals that don't already exist in that area. So all of the sites that I previously mentioned, all of those corals are coming from that area. So we're collecting corals in Mauna Lua Bay for the Mauna Lua Bay project, in Kaneohe Bay for the Kaneohe Bay project. Um, yeah, and so there's a couple of different modes that we can house these corals of opportunity. So after our divers will find these corals, um, they can either go in one of two places. 
So we have in C2 nursery tables. So this just means the nursery table is actually in the site. So it's in the water, in the bay. Um, and we have three in C2 nurseries. So we have our six stainless steel nursery structures in Kaneohe Bay. That is the top right photo. Um, the bottom left photo is our nursery table that was in the airport site, so the South Shore. And then um, in Mauna Lua Bay, that's the bottom right photo. We have two of those nursery structures out there, and that's a little 3D model of that. Uh, we also have XC2 nursery tables. So these are nurseries that are out of the water. So you can see in these photos, um, the one on the right and left are actually at the Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute. Um, so we can collect corals and bring them on land um, and house them in, in a laboratory area. Um, and then the photo in the middle that is in the Coral Resilience Lab. And that's one of our postdocs, Nia, carrying that rack of corals. So um, we take biopsies of these corals of opportunity. So corals, they're colonial animals, meaning that they're composed of thousands of um, genetically similar polyps. And so they all function the same way. So we take biopsies because um, if you take a small piece of that coral, um, it will perform the same way as the, the rest of the coral will. So we want to minimize the amount of, um, of damage that we're causing to that coral um, for the stress testing purposes. So if you take a small piece, they will continue to grow. And then the, the place that you took the biopsy from the coral will also continue to grow and skirt over that, that damage. And so from there, these uh, biopsies will go into our stress testing facility at um, the Coral Resilience Lab on Oahu. So this is a photo of all of our tanks. We have 24 of these and each tank um, is controlled by a computer box. So you can see um, that blue box on the top of that photo. Um, so before they get exposed to the stress test, the corals, they um, are sitting in these tanks for a couple of weeks um, as a as a um, acclimation period before they get exposed to that stress test. So this is the inside of that computer box. And um, it, we take a reading of the temperature of that water every 10 seconds. And it's actually programmed to um, follow a continuous um, heat cycle. So, um, and once they get a reading, um, the water will actually either put uh, warm water or cool water into um, into the tank to correct the temperature. So the photo on the right is our chiller. And then the photo, sorry, the photo on the right is our um, our warm water reservoir. And then the photo on the left is our chiller. So this is a typical temperature profile. Um, so we start elevating the temperature over a period of a few, few weeks. And just for reference, the average water temperature uh, falls between those two blue lines, so between 28 Celsius and about 25 Celsius. Um, so you can see just after a few days that these corals are living out of their comfort zone. They're exposed to these warmer temperatures that they're not used to living in. And so we collect this data by two different ways. So we can get visual bleaching scores. So this is the same rack with the same corals. Um, and this is just over a couple of days or a week or so. Um, and this is what's going to give us our qualitative data. And so the outcome of this test, so we can see a distribution that looks somewhat like this. So this is exactly what we expect. Um, you can see on the left side, there's a big spike of about 50 samples to the left. Um, and these are fragments that have bleached um, either before the stress test or right before the start of the stress test. And then for the rest, um, you can draw a line somewhere in this distribution. And we can consider the corals to the right of that line to be the most heat tolerant, um, and on the left of them to be the less heat tolerant. So another way that we can collect this data, this is our second method, we use pulse amplitude modulation or PAM. So the picture on the right, that is the actual machine itself. Um, and what the PAM does is it collects the photosynthetic activity of the coral. Um, so the coral's ability to perform photosynthesis. And so how we do this, we let our corals acclimate in the dark for about two hours, and that's to let their photosynthetic activity kind of chill a bit before we put them um, in the PAM to take this 
um, and their saturation rates change as well. So this is the more quantitative way of collecting uh, bleaching data. All right. And so going back to our sites, so Mauna Lua Bay is a very special site to me because I grew up in Mauna Lua Bay. Um, and it's also our first site um, after testing other sites, uh, which Hanalei will talk about. It's the, the pilot for engaging community efforts with coral restoration. Um, so we wanted to incorporate community into this project for various different reasons. Um, we believe that everyone should be a steward and this project is really for the community by the community. And um, something interesting about the Mauna Lua Bay uh, site specifically is that we built this program during COVID. Um, and so we we had a lot of hardships trying to build this, but it really um, allowed us to build such an amazing network um, of partners and kind of to see how it played out. And like, now we know what to do moving forward. Um, but in Mauna Lua Bay, so we approached the community first. We actually partnered with Malama Mauna Lua, who is a key partner on this project. And they invited us into their space to incorporate this restoration. Um, and then we followed up with other place-based partners within the area. Um, and something else that's really interesting about Mauna Lua Bay is it's a holistic approach to restoration. So not only do we have the coral restoration taking place, but we also have all of these amazing partners that are doing Mauka and nearshore restoration as well. So the mode of delivering these community events is through Hanapukoa. So um, this means working together for coral. Um, so we invite community members and volunteers to basically work side by side with us uh, during these events. You know, they're right next to our scientists and our researchers, and we're going step by step through the process of how we do this, um, this, this work. And I will walk through some of the steps. Um, I should mention that we there is a difference um, between fragmenting and biopsying the corals. So we always start with biopsying. So that's taking the small about thumb size piece of the coral um, to be exposed to that stress test. And then after we can uh, determine which corals are the more heat tolerant ones, we can go back to those corals and uh, fragment them to be placed out onto the reef. And the reason why we fragment them is because uh, when corals are cut up and when they're smaller, they know that they're small. And so they can actually grow faster and cover more area and a, a less amount of time. So during a Hanapuku'a, we start by tagging the coral. Um, so this is so that we can, when they go back out onto the nursery structure, uh, we're able to identify where the, where the biopsies came from. Uh, so we can track the corals over time basically. And then next we will identify the species of the coral and um, assign it a bleaching score using the Ko'a card. And we'll take a photo of the whole colony as well as the biopsies or the fragments that it came from. Um, and we will also be tracking this through our data sheets that will later get put into our computer system um, for stress testing or for further purposes. And then the last step, if it's a fragmenting event, um, we will completely fragment the entire colony. If it's a biopsy event, we will um, we will biopsy or we'll, sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, we will level out the, the fragments so that they can actually sit nicely on an aragonite plug. Um, one thing to mention is that we are not microfragmenting um, because there's typically a high mortality rate associated with that method. Um, and it's very technical, which in, um, includes, you know, filtered seawater. Um, and since one of the goals of this project is to scale up, uh, we opted for not microfragmenting. Um, but the corals will grow no matter what size they are, as long as they're cut up. Um, and then the last step is we mount the corals. So we label the plug um, with the tag that it came from. We put a dollop of the reef safe coral glue on it and then we mount it on the plug and we take a photo and we put it into um, the racks that will sit in there until they're ready to either go back out onto the reef if they're fragmented or if they're biopsied, they will come to our lab. And then I have a video here. I don't think it's gonna play, but I will 
put the link in the chat if anyone is interested. It it was um from our first Hana Pukua event the summer of 2021. Um, so and it was a really exciting time. Um, it was a beautiful event, and it kind of just walks through the step by step, um, process of what I just talked about. I don't think it'll play. Yeah. So we have a um guidebook available that highlights essentially everything that I just talked about. So, you know, planning for the, for the project, um, community engagement, stress testing, restoration and monitoring, as well as outreach. Um, so this is available to the public, it's completely free. Um, so if you or anyone is interested in receiving this guide, um, please email me, my email is below. Uh, we're happy to share that with you. All right, and now, um, Hanale will take it away talking a little bit more about the sites. All right. Can you guys hear me? I hope so. Anyways, thanks, Maddie. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about all the sites that we've been working on other than Mauna Lua Bay. Um, and our first site that ever had outplants was the South Shore of Oahu uh, at the airport. Um, so like I said, this is the first time we had outplants at any site. In this site-specific example, I, we're looking for trade-offs in thermal versus non-thermal tolerant corals. So I wanted to see if there's a growth difference, um, how they survive. In the case of there being a uh, heat stress event in the future, we want to see uh, which one of the two would do better and last longer. Fortunately, there has not been a uh, bleaching event since we've outplanted them. So we can't really answer that final question, but there's still a lot of trade-offs and cool information that we can still look at. Um, so. Next slide, Maddie. Thanks. Um, so how exactly did this come about? So a couple of years ago, there was a ship grounding that happened right off the Honolulu airport. And Noah was responsible for collecting all the corals of opportunity that that ship created. Um, and what they did is that they, they built an in situ nursery tank right by the site. Um, and they put those corals there. And then it was our job as a lab to, um, I guess, test the resiliency part of this. So what we did, we had to go to the table, we had to take biopsies of the corals, bring them back to our lab, do that whole heat stress thing that Maddie just went over. And that way we can determine what corals, what coral colonies were really good in warm water and what cor corals are not so good. So we broke those corals up into their own respective plots. We had seven plots of high thermal tolerance, seven plots of low thermal tolerance. And we also took uh, six control plots where we did no outplanting. We just photographed the area to try and compare those to the two things we're already comparing. Um, so how we outplanted that, uh, we stuck, we drilled into a, a coral colony and stuck a stainless steel rod into the, into the coral. Uh, think of like a, a coral lollipop, I guess. And then to outplant that, all we had to do was find empty substrate with nothing on it. We use a drill, drill into it. Um, we put safe, uh, reef safe, two part epoxy into the hole and then plop their lollipop right into it hoping that it would stay. Um, in total, sorry, Maddie, in total, we outplanted 425 coral colonies uh, varying in species, but the two main species that we outplanted were Montipara capitata and Parides lobata, being that that's what the uh, dominant species are on those two reef. Um, obviously, outplanting is just one part of the whole pie, so we had to monitor those, and how we did that was by using uh, photogrammetry, and in this case, I know it's a big word. In this case, it's structure for motion photogrammetry. So as you can see on the on the left, there's just two images. Um, on the top is kind of like a, a map, I guess you could say. And there's those little red squiggly outlines. Those outlines are our outplants that we outplanted. And with this, and with this image, you can find things like the surface area of coral, the volume. You can look at the complexity of the whole plot. And you can look at the total survivorship. Um, in research and I guess restoration projects of the past, I, I think they use kind of, um, I call caveman methods to measure these corals. They use like calipers and rulers and sometimes they just didn't monitor or measure them at all. Um, and I really like using this method um, because first of all, it saves us a lot of time and a lot of energy underwater. You don't have to bring all that gear with you. You just have to take pictures of a whole plot and you should be able to pull all the information you need. And not only that, but it gives you like a stored uh, library of data that you could always look back to. There's so many questions that can be asked, and I feel like having that uh, library really helps us answer any of those questions. 
So I think we, we've outplanted these corals now three years ago. Um, we're still monitoring them to this day, but so far we have two years of monitoring analyzed. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and on the results. Um, so uh, looking at the attachment and survivorship of our corals that we outplanted, um, out of the 24 months that we've been collecting data, 72% of our outplants are still there. Um, so, and then compared, sorry, compared to our uh, control corals that are there that we've been monitoring, uh, only 4% have left. So I think it's kind of interesting. Basically, yeah, our outplants are uh, susceptible to getting knocked off the reef, but so are corals that are already kind of established there. And of those 72% of corals that are still there, 86% uh, are still alive to this to this day, uh, or not to this day, but I'm sorry, to the 24 months we've been monitoring. Um, so yeah, important to note that we don't count the 70, we don't count the 72%, I'm sorry, we don't count the 30-ish percent that got knocked off. We don't count that in our survival ship data. Uh, we don't know what happened to them, so we can't really count that. Um, now looking at the complexity of the reefs, um, I guess complexity in this case, uh, in the in the case of photogrammetry is um, how intricate or how much detail or how much space is taken up, I guess. If it's like a flat plane, obviously not, there's no complexity. But if it's like a big reef with uh, caves and big corals, then obviously that's more complex. Um, there's quite a few methods that we can quantify complexity, but we're going to look at fractal dimension. Um, so um, on this left graph, you see we have our uh, the, how many months we've been monitoring our outplants we have the blue dots as are the as the outplant corals and the orange dot as the control corals um and then on the left on the y-axis we have the relative fractal dimension so basically the fractal dimension uh the final fractal dimension divided by what the what it was when we first started monitoring um and as you can see it's not a big bump but it is a noticeable bump and increase from when we outplanted corals um and it's a steady increase meaning that what we outplanted is uh, increasing the habitat and structure of the reef. Um, kind of the same thing showing you on the right. Uh, there's the two time points. Uh, time point one, we didn't have any corals. And time point two is when we outplanted our corals. And as you can see, as soon as we outplanted corals, you could see a big bump in um, fractal dimension. Obviously, that's kind of arbitrary. You'd hope uh, that outplanting corals would bump that up. But still, it was really nice and cool for us to see that what we're doing is actually showing up um, in our methods. Uh, the photogrammetry methods are, I wouldn't say controversial, but they're uh, pretty new, I guess. So this is a good way to show like, hey, like what we're doing is picking up on what we're trying to measure. Uh, so then moving to the thermal tolerance, the non-thermal tolerant and thermal tolerant comparisons. Um, on that top left graph, we have the higher compared to the lower uh, in terms of relative size. So again, relative size is just the final size of the coral uh, versus when we first outplanted it. And as you can see, there's not much of a difference being shown, um, which is it's kind of what we're hoping for. I guess it's like it's an assumption that if something is less thermally tolerant, that means it will grow faster or it should survive more. But our data so far is showing that that's not the case. They kind of grow and they do the same amount of things. Um, in terms of survivorship, I think there's about like... 10% less survivorship uh, from the thermally tolerant corals, which is the red line on the bottom. But still yet, I mean, it's still 80% survivorship. That's pretty good. And that's exactly what we're going for. Um, on the bottom, again, we have the higher and lower thermal tolerance. Uh, we're looking at relative size again. And we're just separating that by the species. Um, there's nothing that stands out too much here. But I do like to point out that the Prides compressa and the Pocillopera meandrina showed pretty good growth. Um, some some corals in Meandrina and Compressa uh, growing about three times as big as they were when they first got outplanted. Um, so moving on to our second site that we outplanted corals on, which is Kaneohebe. Uh, this time around, we're strictly looking at thermally tolerant corals, so no longer comparing the two. Um, and we're using fragments instead of colonies. Uh, Maddie touched on why we do fragments instead, because they grow a little faster. Um, but we uh, went around Kaneohe Bay um, and collected throughout the bay, up north and down south. 
Um, Maddie, you can go to the next slide. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and we collected about 100 different colonies of corals opportunity. And we kept those corals at our ex situ uh, nursery, nursery on the uh, island that we work on. And while we, while we were heat stressing them, we were able to create, I'm sorry, we went way too fast. Uh, we biopsied them and heat stressed those biopsies. And with that, we're able to find what colonies were thermally tolerant. And we were able to make 3000 frags from those thermally tolerant corals. Um, with the 3000 frags, we had to take them to our in uh, situ nursery type nursery site to acclimate them. Uh, the, this nursery table was, sorry, you can go uh, next slide. This nursery table we built in 2016 to support this kind of research. Um, and the reason we needed to acclimate these corals is because when they're at our nursery, when they're at our ex situ nursery um, in our in our tanks, uh, it, it's kind of like they're in heaven. They're like in a spa. They're being uh, watched over. They're being shaded. They're being taken care of from predators. And that's not the real world. So we needed to put them back out in the real world for a little bit before we outplanted them to make sure that they get used to the high light and they get used to currents um, and they get used to predation. Um, so after about six months of them being on these tables, we wanted to see them, we call it skirting the plug, which is when the corals kind of grow over the, the plug that they're on. Um, after six months of that, we were able to finally outplant them. And how we did that is really similar to the uh, airport site. All we had to do was drill into the empty substrate um, the corals are already on aragonite plugs. Um, as you can see, this top left photo, the, that's what we call skirting when the, you can't even see the plug that it's on. It just kind of grew over. And that gives us peace of mind that our corals won't get lost um, due to like high wave energy. So same thing, we drilled into it, put a uh, two part epoxy and just plopped the coral right into the hole. Um, same thing, we needed to, we needed to monitor these, monitor these, and how we did that is a little different from the last site. Um, we're still using photogrammetry, but instead of being like a top-down orthomosaic view, um, we circled the coral a bunch of times, took a bunch of pictures, and we stitched those photos to make like a, a accurate 3D model. Um, these coral fragments are just too small to be using that last method that we did, um, looking from the top down. So this method works perfect for us. And it also gets to show us like all like the small details and intricacies of the coral. Uh, you can see the fingers growing and you can see the coral growing and skirting onto the substrate. Um, that's exactly what we're looking for. And that's, uh, it makes it easy for us to measure all that, measure like growth and, and survivorship. Um, so we monitored these for nine months. Um, so before I really get into this part, uh, we just outplanted these in January of this year. So fairly new. We were just collecting data for this. So um, I guess the data I'm about to show you is kind of like surface level for now. Um, hopefully with more out or not out plan, more monitoring, uh, we're able to answer a lot more questions. But right now, uh, the figure on the right is kind of showing the status of what our outplants look like. So across the board, there's about 25% of the corals that are missing. Um, which seems like a lot, but in the in the long in the long term, and if we're comparing it to the three thousand fragments that we outplanted, twenty five percent isn't that much. That still leaves like over two thousand fragments still out there. Um, as you can see, Parides compressor is doing really good in terms of mortality. Uh, there's none so far that have died, while Montipora capitata is um, not doing so good. But um, in site three, you can see they're doing really bad. Um, site three on the map is like part of the North Bay, which if you know Kaneohe Bay at all, it's really rough. There's a lot more wave action. There's a lot more sediment being pushed around. So we kind of had an expectation that corals at site three and site four wouldn't do as good as uh, corals at site one and site two. Site two is where we outplanted our 3000 corals and that spot is doing uh, really well for us. That's showing us that that was a good place to outplant all those. Um, and then going on to the next figure, um, it's just looking at the relative growth between Montipora capitata and Parides compressa. Um, again, there's not much different between them, which is good. That's kind of what we were hoping for. We don't want to see too much different, uh, too much variance between these two species. And one thing I like to point out is that um, for both capitata and compressa, these corals are um, almost growing twice the size, and it's only been uh, nine months of monitoring. 
So that's really exciting, getting really big. Um, so yeah, so that gets us now to our uh, other site, which is the first uh, neighbor island site. And it says uh, site and island that I like to call home. Um, so like a year and a half ago, um, us from the lab reached out to a lot of partners and um, community members about, well, at, first of all, asking whether restoration should happen and if it should, then where should it happen? Every spot on the map was suggested to us by either a community member or a partner. Um, and as a group together, we've, we all landed on Olawalu being the primary site that we should work on for now. Um, I personally love this decision. I love Olawalu. Um, I obviously growing up on this island and growing up uh, diving and fishing, this spot is really famous. I've fed my friends and my family members off this reef multiple times. So I have a lot of personal connection with it. Um, and it's it's exciting. Along the way, we've teamed up with a bunch of great groups um, and have expanded this project more than we thought we would. Um, we've been working closely with and like getting to know Kipuka Olawalu, which is just Malka of this site. Um, they've been really good in helping like figure out um, Makai, Makai uh, trying to find solutions to Makai problems while we work on, I'm sorry, a Malka problems while we work on the Makai issues. Um, and we're kind of bringing that together to not be just two separate entities, but trying to bring it uh, as like one, one group. Um, and as you, if you, you may know that Olawalu has really bad sedimentation. So we're working closely with Kim Falinski and Lillian uh, and Megan with TNC and USGS and UH Manoa to try and find sediment thresholds in Olawalu uh, dealing with outplants. Um, I guess I guess a better way to say that is we're trying to find a threshold of which our outplants can survive at. Uh, that way, we're hoping that research can lead us to find like, where exactly in, on that Olawalu reef is ready for rest restoration and where it's not so ready. Um, on top of that, we've helped we've helped uh, build up a, I guess, coral nursery, ex situ coral nursery at MOCMI, which is Maui Ocean's Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute. Um, and with that, we're also we've also like built a place where you can um, heat stress our your corals or fragments. Um, and the reason we're trying to do that is we're trying to build capacity for future restoration uh, practices and projects to be done here. Um, we want this to be a place that once our corals are out of there, that uh, other other uh, groups and scientists can go and try and work on their coral restoration projects um, while having like a place to do that. Um, Obviously, uh, if you want to use that space, I suggest that you go ask MOCMI uh, personnel uh, what like their availability availability and space looks like. But that's kind of the goal behind all that uh, decisions. Um, in all, I guess we're waiting to see how that uh, project at Olawalu goes, and then we can kind of gauge um, how a future site on Maui might look. Um, and yeah, if you're not already partnered with us with the CRL for this project, then and you're and you're still interested, just please reach out. Um, we'd love to, we'd love to help out in any way. We kind of just work if we're invited. We don't try to like take over and, you know, go to spots where we're, we're not wanted. So, uh, next slide, please. So I guess just in general for the whole program, um, we want to work where, 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 where we're wanted and just reach out. Uh, Maddie, if there's anything else you want to add, then go for it. Oh, thanks, Anale. Yeah. Um, and we, like I said, we want this to be for the community by the community. So the goal of this is we're um we're teaching community how to take this project into their home and train these th these volunteers and these community members so that um if you want to take the project into your area, if you're passionate about that and you see a need, then you know, we have these resources for you to do so. And that's our goal with this project is for restoration to be accessible. But with that, if anyone has any questions, thank you so much. Um, you can find our emails on the slide, um, our labs, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, social media website, um, as well as the project's website. And yeah. Thank you so much, Hanale and Madeline. Um, we now have, we have a little bit of time for some questions and I have a few, um, let me just get 
them all put in one list. Okay. Okay, so the first question we have um, is what percentage of damage, and I'm assuming this means what percentage percentage of damage uh, done to coral is done by ghost nets? Um, so a good resource to look at would be NOAA. Um, so they they would probably have a, a great answer for that or the Papahanao Moku Akea Marine Debris Project. Um, I don't personally know the answer to that question, but um, yeah. Uh, the next question, um, Hanale, how do you how is it how is how do you decide on a site for um, the restoration? Good question. So deciding on a site kind of depends on um, how good that site already looks. So these sites that we've already been uh, working on, they're already kind of established as like good places to do research and work um, because they're already a, a healthy live reef. We don't want to put uh, out plants and waste a lot of time and effort um, planning in a place that doesn't support uh, any growth or habitat. So I guess the simple answer to that would just be um, wherever has enough open space, but is also showing good signs of life and health. Okay, thank you. And the next question, why doesn't the coral bleach on Palau where the water is 30 degrees Celsius, is anyone studying them? I can answer this. Um, so depending on you know the the location of where we are globally, um, the corals in Palau might be experiencing different temperatures, and they might already be acclimated to these higher temperatures. Um, what we see in Hawaii is the bleaching threshold is twenty eight Celsius. Um, I I believe that there's groups in Palau that are doing research over there. Um, I personally do not know of anyone, but um, Good question. Yeah. So corals, depending on where they are, will be, you know, more adapted to those conditions. So in Kaneohe Bay, for example, um, the temperature is slightly, slightly higher than some other places around Hawaii. And so those corals themselves are might be considered to be um, more resistant. So again, just depends on uh, the, the area where you are in the globe, if you're more equatorial or not, and the corals that you have in that area. Okay. Um, another question is um, regarding the project at Airport Reef. I'm curious about the genotypic diversity in your plots. How many different parent colonies were the fragments from? Have fragments from the same parents been outplanted to other sites as well? So I, I might have done a bad job of explaining it, but for the airport site, we didn't uh, outplant fragments. We outplanted the whole colonies. Um, if you remember, Noah collected the colonies and put it on the table, and all we did was biopsy them and test those biopsies, but we outplanted the whole coral. So there was no fragments involved. And um, in terms of outplanting other sites, we definitely don't want to do that. Every coral that we collect is going to be outplanted back to where it kind of came from in that general area. We try not to split up corals uh, far and wide. Okay. And the last question here is, uh, where do we volunteer on Maui? Are there any... <laughs> opportunities for that <laughs> I can answer that one um yeah so we don't have too much work on Maui obviously we're based on Oahu but um the easiest way would just be reach out and if we have an event that you can uh, be a part of then we'll let you know uh we don't have any in mind right now we have an event tomorrow but we're full in, on capacity on that one. Um, but once, so yeah, just contact us. And if there's an event that you'd like to volunteer at, we can try to set it up. Thank you. Okay. That was, I believe, yep, that was all the questions. So mahalo, Madeline, and Hanale for being with us tonight. We're so appreciative of all the work that you do, and especially for taking time out to be our speakers this month. Um, and to everyone who tuned in tonight, thank you for attending uh, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Oceans speaker series sponsored by the County of Maui. And next month, our, our final 
talk for the, the year will feature more of our coral restoration partners, Alika Garcia and Blake Nowak with Kuleana Coral Restoration. And they'll be presenting on our community-based coral restoration areas in South Maui. We're trying to see if we can make this a special in-person event to cap the, the year. So just make sure you sign up for that free monthly newsletter that we mentioned so that you can stay up to date on that. Um, and the link to the sign up for our email uh, our, our email newsletter is in the chat. And again, if you'd like to make sure that MNMRC can continue to host talks like this and do other amazing things like coral restoration, water quality monitoring, and wildfire response, please consider making a year-end donation to support our work at mauireefs.org slash giving Tuesday. Um, and of course, we'll drop that link in the chat as well. And if for whatever reason, if you've missed some or all of tonight's presentation, you'll be able to view it on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, Maui Reefs. You can also connect with us on social media for more updates and news. And last but not least, we just want to thank all of our sponsors and donors like you who are making our work possible. Mahalo Nui for helping us to Malama Maui Nui. Um, and we hope to see you guys in the future. So thank you guys so much for joining us, Madeline and Hanale. Thank you again for being with us. Um, and we hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the evening. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>